So hey, everybody. Well, welcome to this week's Trinic Tips. I'm your host, Bob Chatterton, and joining us again this week, I'm just going to keep making him a host because we've got a, quite a bit to talk to, is uh, Warren Ness from Rock Sculptor um, and my cohort in Colors. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to pick up our our conversation from the last show uh, where we kind of touched on the colors and we're going to talk about blending some colors. And um, in this, uh, in this episode, we're going to share some pictures um, where it's not just used for vertical work. It's overlays, micro toppings, um, floors, as well as vertical applications. So um, again, it's, uh, we're going to talk uh, referencing the colors system because that's the one we're most familiar with. Um, we know the ins and outs of it. We've got firsthand experience on it. But when we talk about blending um, colors or mixing colors to get different shades and different tones and different accents and things like that, it's going to apply to whichever system you prefer to use. So by all means, um, try out what we're talking about today with uh, with your system of choice. So I'm going to let Warren take over because he's obviously way more experienced in this than I am. But um, let's get into it, Warren. Let's tell him uh, kind of, you know, how to best use colors to maximize our profits. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, the, as you know, as we spoke about in the past, you know, some of you have um, kind of watched the colors uh, roll out in the industry, but it's comprised of your basic nature tones. Um, I thought simplicity was a good, um, a, a imperative a marker for this color system because as you know a lot of these contractors are integrating different sets of skills so like we talked about like the micro toppings the vertical countertops um, and as within all of that there's different product lines for such um, some product lines have different bases and cementitious mixes of grays and whites and buffs and pans and all of that same thing with vertical. So we, we, we thought it was very important to have the ability to change and blend colors based on your project. As these contractors get more and more, have more skill sets or more tools in the tool belt, um, it's just a little more weaponry um, that they can use um, in the job site. Uh, for instance, like a micro topping, you brought up a micro topping in example, um, it's pretty dense. It's, it's on a horizontal plane. The colors are going to sit on top and, and penetrate through, unlike vertical. So when you talk about dilution ratios, it, and, and those factors start to become a factor. Mm -hmm. And being able to manipulate and blend these colors and being able to dilute from a, a one to one all the way down to a five to one, I thought it was imperative. Uh, through the years, through training, has allowed me to observe the contractor you know from texas to florida to oregon um, i've helped a lot of contractors uh, you know use the training wheel system and get on board with it in which i found they do a bunch of very a lot of different things of everything within concrete so just to tag on what you said i'll kind of put a period on the end of that and that's really the cross of that system being able to blend colors easy use universal and being able to um, adapt to your project. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, look at when we do classes, right? You got people that haven't really done anything like this before <clears throat> to people that, you know, make their living off it all in the same class. And it's kind of, um, um, it's educational for us, you know, to have you do a presentation, show people how to do it. And you know, show them a few techniques and then watch them take it from there and kind of come up with different things. Um, you know, how to do a wash and, you know, all of that. And it's not hard. It's super simple. As a matter of fact, I got written down here, simple use and extensive applications, right? Like that's one of the keys to being profitable in this business. And, you know, if you're out there in the field and, you know, you mess up a color, you know, now you can, sort of back up and redo it. But I love the fact that it's adjustable as you go. You know, as a good example, if you want, you know, a light wash and you got a mix of colors in your cup or in your sprayer and you put it up there and 
like, ah, oh, man, that just doesn't look right. All right, well, you know, grab some water, wash it out. And it's just, you know, people look at the finished project and I think that, and I, like, I know I've done it because I don't have those skills, you know, it's just, I don't have those skills yet, I guess I should say. And I thought looking at some of those projects is, man, that, you know, that takes just so much talent and you, you almost get overwhelmed or scared to try it. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think that, you know, once you get your hands in it and see, see like some simple techniques, it just becomes fun. You know, you get to play with it and, you know, you get to look at it as you're doing it and go yes or no, and then chase that down the, the path to yes and finished. And, you know, sometimes the hard things knowing when to quit, right? <laughs> you know? Right, right. But, but uh, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate um, putting a product out from a, from a contractor standpoint is that it's, it's simple to use, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not super difficult. You don't need a PhD degree to, or even an art degree, to be honest. I mean, really to, you know, to figure it out, it certainly is helpful to learn from those that do as I am and everyone that's watching this video and listening to you is doing right now is learning from somebody that is an artist. Um, but you know, much like a magic trick, you're super impressed by the magic trick until the magician uh, occasionally shows you how it's done, you know? Right. I mean, to touch on that, it was a good point about getting it out of the way first. Like, you almost know what you want to do, but learning that, that new system so you get it out of the way so it becomes fun. Now it becomes yeah. fun. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, going from handwriting to typing. It, it's cumbersome, you know, you're learning it, you've got so much to say, but you just got to get the work out of the way. And this becomes a new piece of weaponry in the tool belt. And um, so, yeah. Well, stuff yeah. like, you know, same thing with like a new app on your phone, you know, hey, iPhone's got a new feature. Hey, check this out, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, the first time you go through it, it might feel a little weird, but after that, it just makes your life so much easier. Yeah, and more profitable in the in the end game, you know, True. having it, having it stripped down to nine colors at the saturation and tones that you could achieve. Um, as an artist, it's a no brainer. Obviously, I'm a bit biased being a creator, but um, I think it's I think it's a phenomenal system that word is starting to hit the streets, and we're starting to see some of the reviews because I could think it's great, you know, since sliced bread, but the reviews are in the in the public hand. So, and it's exciting to see that kind of foster and grow. Heck, I love just watching what some people can do with it. You know, like I said, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not out there making stuff every day, you know, or putting stuff down. And uh, I think we, when we kind of previewed this show, we talked a little bit about Mitzi, right? And some of the stuff that she oh, yeah. has done. Oh wow. my gosh, you know, and she's just gotten her hands on a system that she's been able to do things with that go far beyond what the original design was. And, you know, and again, I can't stress it enough because <clears throat> I don't want to make it a super product specific show. Um, you know, it's not our intention here, um, but you can, you know, you can achieve some of the same techniques that, um, you know, that she has used and that we're learning to use out there. But um, we'll show you a couple of those pictures here a little bit later. I'm going to let Warren kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this and start talking about, you know, how you can take some basic colors and adjust those to really get, you know, really hit probably the vision that you have for your piece. Yeah. So um, basically blending, we talked about blending, the nuts and bolts of blending, super important with this system of colors. Um, that's how it's comprised. They're made to blend, uh, meaning that certain browns, if you, if you look at our line, we have a multitude of different browns. One would think, well, let me just get one of the browns. Well, under the brown umbrella, there's a reddish brown, there's an earthy brown, more like mud, and then there's a, like more of a terracotta brown. So you really don't see those colors right out of the bottle until you create washes and blends and you really see that color for its in true inherent color. Um, I know that doesn't make sense on face value for maybe some of you as artists, but
but when you're washing, it's very important. When we obviously, let me rewind a little bit. So when we say a wash, we're, it's a heavily diluted um, tone. Okay, so we put the colors on, whether it's a vertical application or horizontal countertop or floor, we're using a heavily thinned with water, um, we call it a wash or a glaze. Now, within the wash, one um, disclaimer to note, if you're not sealing it, if you wash it too much, it, there's always there's a threshold. And textural surfaces tend to hold more than non-textural surfaces. Something to keep in the back of your mind as you're creating washes and blends. But um, to go on that note, so when you're blending color, you want to go ahead and let me bring up a, a document, maybe help. Um, illustrate kind of what I'm talking about. Okay, so as you can see here, oh, didn't mean to do that. Let me hit undo. I'm not sure. Erase. Okay. Oh, cancel. I'm trying to zoom in here. Could you see that there? I got the whole screen. Yep. I mean, and I can see it perfectly. That's good enough. We'll roll with that. So um, we, we've added a blue to the line. So if you look at the top portion, um, we've added a blue. We'll have that here shortly. It's up for sale, um, but it hasn't made this cheat sheet yet. So black and white um, off to the left on the top column um, border will make the gray. Really super important. Okay. And if you notice in the first... Um, this area right here, let me use the pen. Our first kind of recipe, if you want to call it that, or blending. Here we took tamarack brown and Simpsonite yellow. Okay, so tamarack brown is more of a reddish brown. Um, if you can think of like leather shoes, remember the old leather shoes? Yeah. Real reddish, or maybe even a belt, you know, a nice leather belt that had that, that warm effervescence to it, but reddish. Super, super neat color super versatile in rock and wood because that color is prevalent in both um, species. So we look tamarack brown and Simpsonite yellow. Here's the cool thing about the system. You take that color, mixing that 50-50, off to the left by adding black would give you a tone, excuse me, adding black would give you a shade. Off to the left, you can see I'll make another circle. That's by adding black, okay? Erase this. This will be adding gray to it. We'll make a tone. Right, and the gray is basically you're just blending paleo black and absolute white at one to one for this one. Well, into a twenty percent gray. Great question, by the way. Let me erase that so you can see. If you look at the bottom, um, well, if you look at the bottom, well, yeah, that, that's adding a twenty percent gray. Perfect. Okay. okay. And then adding white to this tamarack brown Simpsonite yellow will give you that tone. A real buttery, this is a nice base tone for wood. A lot of my wood grains will have that tone. It's like, it's not quite honey, but it's more like on a graham cracker side. Very, uh, and obviously how are you viewing this, whether it's on a phone or your monitor sure. or what you're viewing it at um, is, is going to be different. So do, do a test sample. Um, yeah, that's a good point to bring up and I'm going to take the opportunity to inject it here is when you're, when you're working with these, make the concrete that it's going to go on. You know, I mean, we look, we all know concrete varies. Yes, I know, but it's going to be close enough. So don't like necessarily put it out on a piece of paper and think it's going to look like it does on your concrete. Um, and then obviously whether you're using white or gray, <clears throat> cement um, is going to affect it. The color of sand is going to affect it. So you just have to do, you know, your samples and your trials on the same mix. Yeah, exactly. What I, I, I think we talked about it before is baking pans from a dollar store work nice. I keep those on deck. I, yeah. If I'm casting a project or sculpting a project, I'll go ahead and um, take a few handfuls of mud, pack it in. doesn't have to be, you know, super thick just something that represents the color and texture and porosity that you're, you're going to be um, um, providing this color on. Sure. So, and so as we move to the right, you can see, and I won't go through all of these, but you can see how 
just a subtle shift in color, whether it's canyon brown, Simpsonite yellow, it puts out a different color. And one would think like, well, um, it's kind of the same as the first one. It's not until you put them on next to each other. Okay, there's a thing yeah. called spontaneous, there's a, there's a thing called like spontaneous contrast, which means that it gets its information from the color next to it. So mm -hmm. always keep that in mind as you're layering colors, how does it look next to the color that's next to it? Super, super duper important because it changes the result. Okay, and that's why I think having this system is, we don't have to, let's say you mix up too much color and this is a common problem. How much color am I gonna need for this project? Well, when you mix up too much color, I can always swing that color. All right, well, I can use this on the next project. It's a little darker, but man, all, hey, all we gotta do is add a little white, give it a pinch of tamarack brown, and now we've taken that excess, which usually just goes in the back corner, um, <laughs> and now we're recycling. And I do this quite a bit in, in, in the field, and now contractors are starting to do it, keeping em empty Pepsi bottles around, and you're storing color, and you have a project that you can always use gray. I mean, gray is a big component of nature's palette. It's kind of like that all colors seem to find a common ground with the gray. And if you look at like even house colors are stamped concrete. Most stamped concrete, or not most, but, but some of the color charts that's out there are very desaturated tones, meaning that they contain a lot of gray, which makes it softer on the eye, a little more appealing and a little more neutral. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, I can't tell you, I mean, it's, it's bad enough. We throw away, you know, a fair amount of money in uh, multi-component sealers, but no one wants to do it with color. I mean, heck, even in the integral colors, you know how it is. You buy you buy what you think you need for the project, and you end up using you know half to three quarters of it, and you still got money sitting around. You know, no one wants to dump that down the drain. So it's, and I think that's what I was talking about about being um, you know simple to use but extensive uses is you can adjust you know the leftover color to work for something else. Um, you know, you're going to get to a point where it's just going to mud up to the point where you can't do anything with it if you get too extreme with it. But I think we've got a pretty wide margin of error that allows people to adjust when they need to adjust and make use of the product. Oh, absolutely. In, so, in some products, you can't do that. Um, and that's the, the added feature. So when, when we were designing that, that was a big proponent because, again, it's for profit. If, if we can scrounge every part of the pig and, and use that, your profit margin will become higher and you're not putting out a, a degraded product by doing so. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, these colors are thin body. They have to be mixed, okay? And um, when you do storm, let's say you have excess color and let's just say, hey, we use this. It's a little on the orange side. It's not going to work for Mrs. Smith. All you got to do is whip it up add a little color this way or that way, put it on a sample and let it dry. Um, that's, that's highlighted, underlined and underscored there. You have to let these colors dry as you apply them on your sample. Yeah. And um, you're gonna know whether that color's gotta get shifted this way or that way. And uh, that was super duper important when, when creating these. And, um, and the universal property of going on a, in a, a litany of different textural surfaces and porosities. You know, in the vertical world, as opposed to you, you, your background, Bob, I know is in GFRC, tight end surfaces. Sometimes you even have to open up the surfaces with the use of acid. In vertical world, these surfaces are very porous and they tend to, quote unquote, drink up thin bodied stains. So when you found a thin body stain, you would run the other way because it takes a lot of product to permeate and build up any type of color. Now, too much buildup is bad, right? Even with, um, let's just say you had a product line that uh, um, was thin bodied like ours, but didn't contain the right ingredients to get it to do what it needs to do on the surface and sealing up that porosity. It would drink it up. 
And when it drinks it up and you don't have much color because you're, you're trying to get more color in there, what happens is you build up a film and film on concrete in, in my world is something that I, right. I stay away from. So there is a tight threshold and um, yeah. So anyway, something to be cognizant of. I don't want to ramble on that topic, but something to be cognizant of as you're layering colors. Uh, sometimes there is too much. If you keep putting color on color on color, you will develop a sheen. And secondly, you're going to put a film on the concrete. Concrete yeah. is porous. It soaks up moisture. It can hold moisture depending on um, its environment. And yeah, you, you could possibly de -lam. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just going to degrade the concrete. I mean, it's the typical moisture vapor transmission trapped moisture. Uh, the same things we deal with with sealers applies to anything that becomes not breathable. You know, that's why in the sealer world, we're always talking about thin to win and things like that. And a lot of people, you know, shy away from what's classified as uh, a topical, but you know, when used properly, it works exceptionally well. And you know, same thing with colors, but there is a tipping point that you can't get back to. So, right. And I brought this picture up, um, back to the profitability section of it. I like to simp keep things simplified um, when I'm color coloring. And a lot of times we have employees. So we have to, we have got to develop a system. So nobody's just kind of floating off on their own. And in which when you float off on your own, sometimes there's miscommunications, mistakes, which then you got to go back. But keeping things simple, I, I, I keep things in a very simplistic manner base mid and then color washes color washes are nice i usually save the dark for last i work from yeah. light colors to dark and that really helps um with the overall vision of it it's 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 hard to go back or i shouldn't say it's hard it's extra work when you go too dark and then have to go back lighter it does give a different look and um so i try to keep things very in a sequential step base then you got a mid okay and then a, a wash is to kind of help antique it some of those dark tones stay in the texture recesses and it uh it makes the rock look less sterile I, so even with wood grains micro toppings vertical countertops even if it's a fourth step sometimes i do a fourth and fifth step um it's outside of that um i guess ham and egg price point Okay, some of these, some contractors are interested in um, their profit margin. The work has to be um, adequate or above adequate, but it's all about the profit margin. Some people enjoy their work in which the profit margin could become secondary and they would spend more time on it. So, and sometimes a lot of the magic happens within that. You can get a client to, to upsell on something that's a little more unique, maybe a little more coloration a little more um you know jazz pizzazz whatever you want to call it you could do another two steps so but these three steps like this picture here there's a base you, you can see the base color there at the top mm -hmm. um i really like a warm cream i like warm tones a lot of rock happens to be warm a lot of wood grains are in the warm zone and uh that's pretty my go-to color you see the mid-tones are on the reddish side so that's your earth browns, tamarack browns. You can see some of those colors change a little bit because I'm, I'm mixing a little bit of tamarack, a little bit of black, a little bit of gray, a little bit of Simpsonite yellow. Simpsonite yellow and primitive red make orange. I think everybody can get behind that. Red and yellow make orange. Beautiful tones. And go ahead and have fun and pepper those mid-tones in. Get it really um, moving around. Have your eye move around the piece a little bit in terms of um, color splotches, okay? And then lastly, um, the washes. Put some areas of dark and, you know, couple, multiple passes. You can make a couple passes. This is what's nice about a wash. You can make four or five passes, but maybe go a little heavy, heavier in these areas. Maybe go, you know, six passes opposed to just two over here. You're going to get a very dynamic um, output in the uh in the work yeah i think uh i mean 
just take a look at reference photos, right? Because sometimes you're too close to the work to, you know, catch the nuances. And like, I love this picture because you can see the base coat in it, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, you get where all the mid-tones really add the 3D to it. And mm -hmm. then the distress and the washes or the antiquing, you know, those are the character marks on it, you know, and, um, and believe me, if I can, if I can talk with some sense of, um, of authority on it, it's because I learned it and I see it, you know, I can look at now look at a reference photo and go, Oh, well, okay, well the sun hits it here. This is going to be a little bit of shadow there, which quite honestly, let's do that as another show as in, you know, how are you bringing out all that detail? Um, you know, and uh, you've given it that 3D look. Now, obviously, with vertical rock, we're creating a lot of that in the carving process, but it gets lost if it's all monotone. Very, yeah, I like that. I like the word you use, 3D. Um, the 3D, yeah, is added through the, the glazing. Mm -hmm. So um, good, that was a very, very good point. And just to add on that, that's the importance of picking your tone. So here's a tip for you guys out there. Um, let's just say you have a client, you're doing a rock countertop, and you, your, your client is showing you pictures of the color sets or the colors that she's looking for. Well, when in picking a color, you really kind of want to train your brain to see colors in combinations. So what would it take to get that final color? If A plus B is equal to C, you're looking at really, she's showing you the C, what, where are the A and Bs that make that C? And so the word you use 3D was perfect because you're using two colors to make that resultant color by, uh, uh, I'll call it an opaque base tone. You know, that base tone here is like that cream khaki honey. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna cover a lot of the rock and you want it to kind of sealing it up a little bit. And, and don't be afraid to mix and match that base tone with an offshoot of that. You could add a drop mm -hmm. of black to that just to kind of model that as well. But yep. the, to get the 3D is to do a semi-transparent um, effect over that base tone. So now as the light hits that surface, reflects back to the eye, you're getting it that what you call a 3D effect to depth. And that's how rock is because rock, it, it's that color throughout the whole, the whole unit. It's not just like a full finishing glaze or something you would see on a piece of drywall. A piece of drywall is usually primed. It's got texture primed and they come in there and they're painting it. In this case, we're staining it where light is still able to kind of pass through those outer surfaces and reflect back to get that 3D effect. Yeah, and those subtle, those subtle shifts, I mean, all in the same family, but that's what creates kind of the depth to it too and the visual texture. You know, it, it, it brings out, like if you flaked, you know, here's a good example, right in that the center of the picture that's in the middle of the screen right now is, you know, where that was flaked away on that, on that granite face there. Yeah. You know, um, you know, that texture is not only just in the concrete, but the visual texture is in the color that goes with it. You know, the same way with the charcoal or black that's splashed on, you know, to, to mimic the growth um, you know, the biological growth on the rock. So yeah. perfect. But, yep. You hit it on the head. Doesn't cost anything to pay attention, right? And you 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 hit it right on the head. You're looking at the textural um light plays it back there. We'll keep that on another um another episode before I go yeah. babbling on about that. <laughs> yeah. And uh but the light does play a big big part of it. But um keeping things simplified it's going to put you on a, a straight path to producing, I think, better looking work as far as coloring. Do me a favor. Can you bring up the um, blending sheet for back, lack of a better term? Yeah. And let's just end this with kind of a, a quick overview to go over this sheet again. And, um, you know, for the listeners that are out there, you know, guys, we can help you but I want you to pay attention to this sheet and understand, you can see on the right hand side where, you know, the grayscale that Warren has there, 
you know, to start with the grays, like, uh, you know, if we say it's a 15% or 20% or 30% gray or whatever, these are the, um, you know, mixing the black and the white together to get a gray that becomes, you know, for, uh, again, I guess, lack of a better word in my terminology is a primary color, you know, or that we're going to add in to adjust some of the other colors. Um, and you can see how some of those colors are drastic. Um, you know, the amount that you put on isn't, that's kind of the final step. You get to adjust that while you're doing it, but your color is adjusted right here. Um, so Warren, can you speak to that with more knowledge than I have real quick, just before we yeah, that, that, close this that, out? It was a very good, very good point. So, um, Here's my, let me just, let me just open it up with my mixing sequence, how I mix color. So Perfect. I start with my gray. Lot, we always talk about you need the gray. Just go look at some of the pictures in nature. Believe it or not, there's a lot of gray in that. You may not think it does, but it does. So I always start with my gray. Let's just say I'm mixing up four quarts of uh, color. I would start with the four quarts of gray. I get it to about a 20%. 20% seems to work for a lot of different things. So I always kind of start in that zone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we'll talk about that on the next one, but white concrete and, and more darker tone concrete, um, you're going to have to adjust for that. But I start with my gray and then I add the coloring. What is the color? Those could be Tamarack Brown and Simpsonite Yellow. That could be, actually I just did a, a recipe last week that came out really nice on a job and we did um, Simpsonite Yellow and um, um, uh, Canyon Brown. 50-50, and we added that 20% gray, it made a nice wheat, like a wheat or a khaki, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't think they'd be so different, but just mixing that with a different brown, obviously gonna give you a different result. And start with your gray, and then I would stir that color in to get it where I like it. It's very similar to culinary, and I would stir that color in and we'll get it where I want it. I'm like, let's just start there. I could always add more color. So let me just stop at this safe zone, put it on our sample that we talked about in the beginning of our episode here, put a swab on there mm -hmm. as you would apply it using a spray bottle, a brush, a sponge, whatever you're doing, just mimic those same sequences and let it dry. Walk away, come back. If you need more color, that's great. Go ahead and add a little more color. Now here's where it gets cool is when you get advanced, you can take that color and say, you know what? I like that base tone. It's a not where I need it, but let me split this 20% gray in half and add a little more color to the second batch. So you're now, add, so you're, let me just stop yeah. you for a second here, just to clarify. So you're starting with gray in like a mid gray in a cup, and then you're adding the color blend to that. Correct. Wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. So, okay, beautiful. and it makes a difference, right? You know, it makes it better because I can see it. And again, it's, it's training. It's that new piece of software you just alluded to in the beginning. Like what you see in the uh, mixing container versus when it's on the concrete and dry are two different distinct things. Yes. Indeed. So get start. You're going to start training your eyes. Like, you know what? Let me stop there because I could always add more pre-blended color. Yep. And or, um, yeah, so to answer your question, yeah. Um, so as far as drying it goes, does it hurt anything to speed dry it? Heat gun, air gun, you know, throw it in the sunshine, anything like that? Man, great point. Down in Texas last week, we were doing a recolor. Um, if it's too hot, the colors won't blend out, settle out. Dries too quick. Yeah, natural evaporation as opposed to an accelerated evaporation because then okay. it stays on the surface, right? We mm -hmm. want to kind of blend in and permeate that concrete. Um, so having a wet surface really helps aid in um, bond and permeation into the uh, cementitious structure. And yeah, and let's clarify, wet means damp, not soaking wet. Correct, correct. Damp, good, good, good call. Um, very damp. Obviously, texture surfaces be cognizant of all the little pit holes. Those little pit holes tend to hold water. What so I was getting at, yeah. Bring a broom, a broom out there. If you're doing a horizontal, it's got very aggressive texture. I usually pack a broom or a blower and just mm -hmm. run a blower on it, then do your color application. Yeah, just to blow off any standing water is what we're talking about here. Yes. You know, I mean, 
you want the concrete wet because um, otherwise it can suck the color in um, quickly. Yeah. It'll drink it in. Two things, one, like Warren alluded to earlier, is it'll get lost in there. Or the second thing that happens is it flash dries on the surface and you get a false sense of the intensity of what that color is going to be where you don't get it uh, any penetration where if it's damp, it uses the water as a vehicle to pull itself into the concrete and you'll get a more realistic look. It won't look quite as painted or on the opposite side of things. If it drinks it in, you won't lose it all. Yeah, and as you know, some of the sneaky tricks that you've seen at uh, some of the Trinity trainings and using solvents and stuff like that, and you can get some really cool effects and go the other way with it where you kind of sure. want that effect on, a, on an artistic GFRC piece, of course. Right, of course. And, then they're, and again, just to reiterate, they're two totally different pieces. So you go on dense concrete, even if you open it back up, um, the PSI strength of the concrete is huge. You know, if you got, uh, you know, and if you're talking about going in and sprucing up somebody's driveway or sidewalk or patio or anything like that, whether it was air and trained or not, will make a big difference. Big so, uh, you know, back to, you know, test it on the pieces you want. And the kind of the cool thing with this is if you really hate it, as long as you get it before it dries, you can pretty much wash it off and start all over again. Yeah, or pressure washer, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So, well, Warren, thanks a lot for going through all this. There was some, you know, nuggets that I picked up, and I'm sure there were some things there. Um, before we go, can you show off, um, I think it was a micro-topping picture that um, Mitzi oh, yeah. from Concrete Patina did? Yeah. She, uh just to show, you know, hey, some of the different applications that aren't necessarily vertical rock. We always yeah. tend to talk about the things that we know the most about. And uh, I just want to broaden our horizons and our viewers' horizons a little bit here. And Yeah, let me bring that up right now, my friend. And... Okay. This job was in Texas, the one you're bringing up? Yes, it was in Texas. Let's see here. Let me share screen. There we go. Okay. You guys see, you can see that? Okay. So, yeah, there yeah. you go. You got to know. Yeah, her name is Mitzi Hoffman. Yeah, she did a really nice job on um, this micro topping, and um, really caught my eye. I think she's first time user to the product, so and I think I think she's an artist, and she she really just took it and ran with it. Let me bring up another photo. There's a close up of it. And that's uh, sealed, right? That's after it was sealed. That was after it's sealed. Yeah. But if you also, that photo, there's a warm undertone to that. Remember that English leather belt I was kind of describing? Yeah. Uh, and it's not just a brown coating. There's there's a bit of what you call 3D depth in that. And I'm sure just like pictures in reality, I'm sure it looks a little better in reality, but the picture um, um, really shows a nice job and use of the colors there. You see yeah. Some, like yeah. it looks, you know, it looks like wood. I see, you know, heck I've done it you know some pieces that you take too far and you know they get you know they get lost in darkness out there and yeah you know it looks you know it looks like wood it looks you know the traffic pattern down the center of it that even though no one's really worn a traffic pattern in it yet has that nice little bit lighter look to it um you know I think she did a fantastic job so yeah, big one, yeah, yeah, wanted to give her a shout out for allowing us to use her photos and just, uh, you know, give an example as, you know, she is an artist, but first time user, you know, don't be afraid of it. This is, you know, this is not beyond your capabilities by any means. This is a way that you can put a tool in your toolbox with a little bit of understanding that can maximize the profits on the job. <clears throat> um, Warren, you, you know, you alluded to it earlier <coughs> about 
you know, profit versus detail, you know, some contractors will, you know, do a project that's good enough, you know, and they, they make a little more money on it because they spend a little bit less time on it, but it's nice. And look, some customers warrant that, right? Like that's what they have paid for. Um, But there are customers out there that you don't have to walk away from that are the primo cream of the crop, top of the line, want the, you know, want something that's as realistic as the real thing, but better because of the wearability of it and everything else. You know, the fact that, you know, you can use concrete for decking like this versus wood, where you don't have to worry about it rotting, you don't have to worry about insect damage and all that happy stuff. So, right. you know, but you given that top high end customer, the absolute detail that they're paying for, and then, you know, their friends see that, you know, you, you hit social media with pictures like this, designers see it. And that's how this whole industry grows. But more importantly, even than that, is that's how your bank account grows. You as the contractor that's out there putting this stuff down. Again, you don't need an art degree to do it. You need a little bit of practice and a little bit of guidance. And there you go. You know, you can up your square foot price significantly based on that detail. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it, uh, you said it best right there. Um, it's it's going to provide a major, major um, enhancement to your um, portfolio by expanding your knowledge set. Like you said, a little bit of um, practice, a little bit of uh, passion goes a long way. And um, yeah, give them a try. Yeah, man. Can you take that pick down and go back to the regular yeah. screen for a sec. Yeah. Cool. So, all right. Words to the wise in closing. Um, have fun. Have fun. Doesn't cost anything to pay attention. Start to become a little more observant in nature. If you're looking to um, grow or, or get better at your craft, um, there's little things along the way that you can do that doesn't require any money. Um, I think we're still going through um, everything that's going on in our nation right now. So little things can go a long way and um, yeah, have fun. And yeah, that's about it. Cool. Um, So people are going to have questions or actually if you want a copy of that sheet that we have up there and we've got a couple other ones that we're working on, that'll be a little bit more um, detailed and eventually we'll have them up on our website, but um, we're, we have a new app that's out there and we're working through some issues with the store itself. So, um, you know, we'll get those ironed out and then get that up there. But in the meantime, if you guys want the sheet that we showed on the screen here, then you can email info at trinic.us and we'll make sure we reply to you. Um, that's a great email to send stuff out to. If you need to get a hold of Warren, it is info at rocksculptor.com. Yes, sir. And, um, you know, you can check us out, more pictures on um, on Facebook, of course, on Instagram. Um, what's Mitzi's page? Concrete Patina, right? Concrete Patina. Concrete, concrete Patina, just looked at that um, before we got on here today. There's tons of great pictures there. And if you've got questions, you can reach her through that source. So um, guys, I appreciate you so much. Um, Hope it's been helpful. If it is, and you like what you see and you want to see more, drop some comments below. That's really what we're looking for. Um, We want to engage with you. We want to help you. We don't want you to stumble and struggle. Um, that's what we're doing this for. That's what we're all about. Um, we enjoy seeing what you guys do and we want to help you as much as we can along the way. So, um, share the page, share the video. Um, that's how these algorithms work. And honestly, the more people that see it, the more people that we're going to help. And once more people start putting out some crazy good stuff like this, then our industry is going to grow. And when our industry grows, our profit grows. And that's what it's all about. So thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you later.